Okay, I think we're ready to start talking about metabolism, and I want to just give a couple of brief definitions for catabolism and anabolism. And really, if I were to say in layman's terms what catabolism is, it is the breakdown of larger molecules into smaller molecules. So I just kind of remember catabolism breakdown and anabolism, if I were going to say what that is in simple terms, I would say that that's the synthesis of molecules, or building molecules from lar building larger molecules from smaller molecules. But these are more formal definitions, and might be the way you might want to write it on an exam, or, uh, but if you remember just, you know, breakdown synthesis, breakdown synthesis, you'll, you'll probably be okay to, uh, to fill in the rest. So catabolism is the breakdown of larger molecules such as carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins to generate starting materials and energy. So catabolism generates energy and starting materials. So again, it provides carbons for um, the different pathways for the citric acid cycle, etc. And anabolism is the synthesis of more complex molecules from simple precursors. So again, taking simple molecules and creating more complicated or more complex molecules from those. So I have the stages of catabolism, and, and kind of what I like about the stages of catabolism is it kind of shows how all the different metabolic pathways, it doesn't matter if I'm breaking down proteins, or I'm breaking down polysaccharides, or I'm breaking down lipids, they all sort of converge on this one central compound, acetyl-CoA. And um, so starting with proteins, we break the proteins down into their, con their smaller parts or constituents, and those are amino acids. And the amino acids are then eventually converted to acetyl-CoA. And the same thing with polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are broken down to monosaccharides, eventually become acetyl-CoA, and lipids to glycofatty acids or fatty acids, and then to acetyl-CoA. Okay, and acetyl-CoA is what enters the citric acid cycle. That's the first molecule that enters the citric acid cycle. It combines with uh, oxaloacetate to make citrate in the first reaction of the citric acid cycle. And it's also, it, it's important because, as you can see, everything comes together at that one molecule, enters the citric acid cycle, and we all know the citric acid cycle, or we should know the, the citric acid cycle, you know, is capable of producing a lot of reduced electron acceptors, and those, those reduced electron acceptors enter oxidative phosphorylation, they're um, passed along, the electrons are passed along by the respiratory complexes located in the um, inner mitochondrial membrane, and that and that, and that ends up generating somewhere between 30 and 32 ATPs. So in aerobic respiration. So that's an important concept, big picture concept. And now I want to talk a little bit about coenzyme A because coenzyme A is really important. And what I have here is just like a like a shorthand version of acetyl CoA. So here's your acetyl group. It's two carbons. Remember from um, organic chemistry, if you see acid, ac, ac, acetate or acetyl, the acid, the acid part of it is the, um, means two carbons. And form, you might remember like formaldehyde means one carbon. So this is um, a shorthand version of that. And coenzyme A performs the vital role of transporting acetyl groups, so transporting two carbon groups from one substrate to another. So the key, the key to CoA's action is the reactive thioester. So this is a thioester bond over here that we're talking about. So there's a reactive thioester. And the thioester is stable enough to survive inside the cell, but unstable enough that acetyl-CoA can readily transfer acetyl groups to another molecule. So it's stable enough inside the cell, but it's not too stable, okay? That it's, it's still reactive enough. So the major pathway or I shouldn't say the major, but it is one of the major pathways, and it is the first one most people um, talk about when they uh, when they start talking about metabolism, because the carbohydrate and um, breakdowns of polysaccharides, it could, the catabolism of polysaccharides is important. So glycolysis is one of the first pathways you'll talk about, and it takes place in the cytosol, so that's important. That comes up in a lot of questions. You'll see people say, you know, uh, where does glycolysis take place? For example, that just might be a question. They say you'd have to know it takes place in the cytosol. They say, you know, compare and contrast the places where glycolysis takes place and citric acid cycle takes place, um, you know, the parts of the cell. Um, so you, you need to kind of know that. It's important just to kind of remember. And 
glucose is the first reactant in the glycolysis pathway, so obviously what glycolysis means is the breakdown of glucose, because that's what we're going to use. We're going to break down a six carbon glucose molecule into two three carbon, two three carbon pyruvate molecules, okay? So that's what this is. Glycolysis is the catabolism of glucose, okay? And one molecule of glucose is converted into two molecules of pyruvate in a 10-step process. So this is a long process. I mean, and the reason for that is that enzymes can generally only catalyze one biochemical reaction, okay? So if you have an enzyme, it can only catalyze one biochemical reaction, and every one of these um, reactions, every one of these 10 reactions in, the, in this process are, require different enzymes. So they can only make one chemical change to the substrate at a time, all right? And there are three regulated steps in the pathway, so that's important. Um, you can tell a lot and learn a lot about this process just by looking at the regulation. And the final products, this is important to remember the final products, always remember the final products, are two ATPs, two NADH, and two pyruvates, and some water, okay, some H2O. The important ones are the two pyruvates, the two ATP, and the two NADH, because that's reduced electron acceptors, that's um, two ATP, it's energy, right off the bat, it's a net of two ATP, and two pyruvates are important too, because those end up getting converted to acetyl-CoA. Now, I have my drawings of glycolysis pathway. I use these actually in the class, and um, they, they weren't bad. Now, a, a note of caution here, do you need to do this? Do you need to draw all these out and memorize every single um, drawing and every way and all the enzymes and everything? Um, in, in a simple word, no. But was it helpful in the class? Absolutely. So the choice is yours. If you have the time to do that, then I would do it. If not, you know, try to just focus on the more important reactions in the pathway, which I'll point out. So the first reaction here is the phosphorylation of glucose. Okay, I have a glucose molecule. I'm adding a phosphate group to it using ATP. I'm using the hydrolysis of ATP to provide energy and a phosphate group. And the enzyme is hexakinase here. Okay, and that's important. And it produces what's known as glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, so we're phosphorylating glucose, and we're left with ADP and H+. So this is one of the regulated steps. So remember that, the first step here, hexakinase, regulated step, extremely important. And it also has a negative delta G, so it's a spontaneous reaction. It occurs in directions written, and that's because we're using energy here from ATP. So reaction two is just an isomerization. This is not all that important. Um, if you're trying, if you're not memorizing the whole thing, this is one that you can kind of just, if you know what happens here, then that's about all I'd, I'd worry about. So you're starting with glucose 6-phosphate. This is just a linear version of glucose 6-phosphate. And then we have what's being, it's being isomerized to fructose 6-phosphate. So your final product here is fructose 6-phosphate and the enzyme is phosphoglucoisomerase. Okay, phosphoglucoisomerase. So reaction three, this is another important reaction and this is another regulated step. So, so the third step is also regulated. As fructose 6-phosphate, it's being converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. It's using ATP, okay? And, there, and the enzyme is known as phosphofructokinase, or PFK1. So phosphofructokinase 1 is the enzyme that's extremely important, as are the products and reactants here. So fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, okay, because we're adding another phosphate group. We now have two phosphates on this molecule. And the reason this is important is because fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is the committed molecule for glycolysis, okay? This is the committed molecule. The other, the other um, intermediates we formed previously, um, they could be drawn off and used in different pathways, but this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, this must be, this must go through glycolysis, okay? This must finish going through the process of glycolysis. Reaction four, we have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate being converted to two separate three-carbon molecules. So now we're starting to see the catabolism here, the, the breakdown. Now we have two three-carbon molecules. One is known as dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and the other is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. 
and the enzyme is aldolase. This is important because at this point you can see the, the pathway splits and now we have two molecules so that we're going to end up with two pyruvates at the end. This is how it happens because we'll end up with splitting this uh, six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. So that's kind of an important point. They might ask you on an exam at what point does the, um, does the pathway split? And, or, or at what point is the reactions doubled? And that would be at right after that aldolase reaction there. So reaction five here, at this from this point on, I even wrote it up here, two molecules of everything from this point on, okay? Dihydroxyacetin phosphate is converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. This is not an insanely important reaction, but it just shows you that that dihydroxyacetin phosphate that was created initially is going to be converted also to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And that's by tri triose phosphate isomerase. That's the enzyme, triose phosphate isomerase. Reaction 6 here, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. We also have NADP, so this is an electron acceptor and inorganic phosphate. And what winds up happening here is we get 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, okay? So we're going to add a phosphate up here, plus NADH, plus H+. Plus. Okay, so one thing to notice here is we need NAD+, plus for glycolysis to keep working. So you're going to need NAD+, plus. you need a source of NAD+, plus, or you need a way to regenerate NAD+, plus. and we'll talk about how you do that later. And the enzyme is glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase, so glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase um, and it says here, I wrote here a little note, oxidize, oxida, oxidation is providing energy to put the phosphate on the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Okay, so oxidation. So we're doing an oxidation reaction here. This is being reduced, this is being oxidized. Okay, so the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is being oxidized, the NAD plus is being reduced. So reaction 7 here so reaction 7, if I can get it to focus, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate plus ADP goes over to 3-phosphoglycerate plus ATP. So we're phosphorylating ADP to make ATP, okay, at this point. So we're phosphorylating ADP to make ATP. And you can see here we have ATP, 3-phosphoglycerate, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, ADP, and H+. And that enzyme is called phosphoglycerol kinase phosphoglycerokinase. Okay, so reaction 8 down here. This is going to be another is a mutase reaction, which is slightly different from an isomerization. I won't explain why at this point, but 3-phosphoglycerate is converted to 2-phosphoglycerate, okay, by phosphoglycerate mutase. So phosphoglycerate mutase converts this. Now this is the most important, well, one of the more important parts here of the um, pathway, and that's the final two steps. So we have this 2-phosphoglycerate formed by the mutase reaction. Now we have enolase here which is, and the loss of H2O which is going to form a highly reactive intermediate here which is phosphoenol pyruvate. Phosphoenol pyruvate, extremely important molecule to no. know. And know that it's high energy, okay? This is an enol and um, it's extremely reactive and wants to do and wants to go to the next thumb. Um, go on to the next pro go on to the product actually. So what ends up happening here is phosphoenol pyruvate is going to phosphorylate ATP or ADP rather to ATP and it's going to form pyruvate. Okay, that's that's the final reaction is phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate and we have the phosphorylation of ADP to make more ATP. That's our two molecules of ATP and two molecules of pyruvate. And that enzyme is pyruvate kinase. Now the other important thing to remember about this final reaction here is that this is a regulated step, okay? Pyruvate kinase is an, is, is, an, is an enzyme that's regulated and various things either activate or deactivate it and we're going to talk about those things in a future video.